No mai, haere mai, kia ora tato, and welcome to the eighth episode in the Auckland Writers' Festival Winter Series. Ko Paula Morris aho. Uh, my name is Paula Morris, and I'm speaking to you from Grays Avenue in Auckland. Now, here in New Zealand today, it is the winter solstice, so therefore the perfect time to read and talk about books. In this hour, I'll chat with each of our writers about their latest book. We'll hear a short reading from each of them. And towards the, the end of the episode, all three writers will return for a final question or two. You are very welcome to make comments or ask questions throughout the episode. Just use the chat functions on Facebook and YouTube. I'll try to include your questions if we have time. Uh, the books we're discussing today are available for sale or order. Just click on the buy the book link in the episode description. Remember that the series is free to view. So if anyone asks you for credit card information, please ignore them. And don't click on any links in the comments unless those links are supplied by the Auckland Writers Festival. A thanks as ever to our generous technical partner, Auckland Live, and to Copyright Licensing New Zealand for their support in making this series possible. Now, let us welcome our three writers. Uh, joining us from Wellington, Philippa Swan, author of the novel, The Night of All Souls. Kia ora, Philippa. Kia <laughs> uh, Also in Wellington, though in a, a colder part of Wellington, because it has its microclimates, as we all know, <laughs> the poet uh, Freya Daly Sadgrove. Uh, she's here to talk about her debut collection, Head Girl. Tēnā koe, Freya. Tēnā koe. And zooming in from Virginia, where it's very hot in the afternoon, the novelist Helen Habila discussing his new book, Travelers. Kia ora. Hello, Helen. Hello. Now, Freya and Helen, please sit tight. We will magically disappear you, and I look forward to talking to you in just a moment. Our first guest today is Philippa Swan. Uh, Philippa trained as a landscape architect, a background that informed her first book, Life and Death in a Small City Garden, and subsequent work as a freelance writer. Her new novel, The Night of All Souls, is a reimagining of the life and afterlife of the novelist Edith Wharton, author of The Age of Innocence, among other things, and another writer who is also passionate about gardens and their design. The book has been described as a TARDIS of a novel, stories within stories, memories and admissions. And within all this, a contemporary novella that a long dead Edith Wharton reads aloud to the ghosts of her past. And the big question the novel asks is, are our secrets ever safe? Kia ora and welcome, Philippa. Kia ora. Now, Philippa, it is almost 20 years since you published Life and Death in a Small City Garden, to much critical acclaim. What lured you over to the dark arts of fiction writing? Uh, it was probably not a good idea monetarily, but um, I don't know. I think I, I became far more interested. I used to write a lot about gardens and design and people in, in spaces, and I just became more and more interested in the people, and that led me to fiction somehow. <clears throat> Now, Edith Wharton, the great American novelist from the early 20th century, is your main character here. My own introduction to reading her work was to read The House of Mirth, which was her first real bestseller, wasn't it, um, from 1905. I was a student when I read it, and I was in awe of her sharp eye and her wit, um, and also the darkness of the, of the subject. What drew you to Wharton as a reader and then as a writer? Um, definitely the House of Mirth, I think, is kind of Edith's gateway drug. There's no doubt. It's, it's the perfect book to start with because it's, 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 it's funny, it's sharp, it's acerbic. It's, it's, it, it dissects, she dissects kind of societies um, almost like an anthropologist. Um, it, it's a wonderful place to start. So for a while, I just kept with the House of Mirth. It was one of those books I kind of read once a year, maybe, because it was my favourite book. And then I started reading other books. But I never really thought about Edith as a person. Um, I just kept reading her. And I think if I if I think back now, I probably had this image in my mind of maybe a character in, I don't know if you've seen the, the, um, the movie The Age of Innocence. But I think I kind of had this vision of her as sort of shrouded in black and very imperious and austere. And because I knew she came from a very wealthy, privileged background. <clears throat> and I thought she'd be quite... Um, uh, a very um, unsympathetic kind of person. I, I didn't really like the idea of her. And then Hermione Lee wrote a biography on her. I think it was in the early 2000s that I read. 
<clears throat> and I just couldn't believe it. Edith Wharton was this incredibly amazing woman. She's fierce and passionate and proud and headstrong and very, very independent. And I thought, what an amazing woman. I would love to write about her. And also her, her life story was incredible. And I thought, how could I not have known this being such a good fan of her writing? And how come other people don't know about this amazing story of her life? And in fact, many Auckland Writers' Festival uh, viewers will be familiar with the Hermione Lee biography you mentioned. Hermione Lee was a guest at the festival a few years ago. Mm -hmm. She was also my dissertation supervisor for my PhD, but that is another story. Okay. Now, as you say, Wharton seemed to have this very conventional youth, very privileged, living in Europe, living in New York, in Newport, Rhode Island. She made a very conventional marriage. She didn't become an, uh, an author till she was in middle age. Now, her marriage to Teddy Wharton was unhappy, and he is a figure who appears in your book, along with her great friends, Henry James and Walter Berry, and also her incredibly caddish lover, Morton Fullerton. Now, what she knows and doesn't know about Fullerton is central to your story. Mm. And I wonder if we could talk about this a bit without giving anything away. Mm. Could you expand on the importance of this, uh, this essential relationship for her in your book? Yeah, there's a, on, on, on the back of the book is a quote of, a, 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 um, I won't say who wrote it, but it, it's the letters survive and everything survives. And that is critical to Edith Wharton because, because she was a writer, it's obvious, she wrote so much stuff down. So there is so much evidence of her life. And it's about how much, when, when she died, I guess what I wanted to look at was when she died, that was the end of her kind of existence on earth. But she continued to live on in terms of her identity because she left so many papers behind. You know, she left secret diaries, letters, um, writing that she didn't necessarily want published. And, and this was what I wanted to know was who took charge of these papers? What happened to them? Where did they end up? Um, and so very much part of the story is her trying to, it's almost like a mystery, her trying to discover what happened to this stuff after her death and particularly a lot of it is to do with with Morton Fullerton and she felt when she died I think that that was the end of things but it, it wasn't and and the story of where her papers and the evidence of you know certain parts of her life what happened to those papers to come into the public realm over time is really interesting story in itself. Now from what we've been talking so far I could imagine some viewers would think this is a historical novel it is to some extent, but it is so much more than that. When we first meet Edith Wharton in your novel, well, will you tell her, tell us where she is when we first see her in your novel? Right. Um, well, Edith, Edith loved ghost stories. She wrote three volumes of ghost stories, and it was something that interested her all of her life, and towards the end of her life, even more possibly. And in fact, um, so I think her last publication after her life was, was a collection of ghost stories. Um, so we find her in a small room in the afterlife with various friends from her life, or not necessarily friends. Some of them were very unhelpful to um, her during her life and after her death. So she's in a very um, unpresuming kind of room with six others, and beside her chair is a novella, and the novella is a modern novella. It's, um, it's inspired by her life, and it's set in modern times. Um, and within the pages of the novella, there will be um, some clues that will give Edith an idea of what, um, what of those letters and, and the information survived. Because basically, she has a choice. If she allows publication of this modern novella, it might reignite interest in all of her writing in the modern world, which is something she would very much want. But she is also warned that will, it will... Um, direct interest from the modern world towards the secrets of your life. So what she has to decide is, or try to find out, is what of those secrets she hid in her life have survived today? And the only way that she can find out is by what's in the room tonight. And that is what is in the pages of the novella. There's also um, a bookcase with some useful books in there that she's going to have to find some answers from. And may, maybe most critically, the others in the room tonight, they know secrets about you that they don't necessarily wish to divulge. So it's a, it's a mystery, among other things, as well yeah. as the story, yeah. 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 <laughs> Now, you mentioned Hermione Lee's biography, and uh, there's a really interesting um, observation that Hermione Lee makes about Edith Wharton's work, and she describes it as exploring the negotiations 
between the desires of individuals and the pressures of convention. Mm. And obviously for Wharton, those pressures of convention were immense, but I, I wondered nowadays, does that notion of convention and the re enormous repression that demands, particularly uh, for women writers of her era, does it have anything like the same power in contemporary literature? Possibly not, but I think there are still themes that are very similar that I think would resonate today, particularly um, around uh, maybe, you know, the, 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 the female ambition and motherhood and um, trying to earn a living and from writing. You know, she, a, a lot of it is about um, a woman trying to pay the rent, basically. Um, so a lot of those themes, although they're not, you know, you think back to, again, maybe the what most people might remember is the movie of the age of innocence you know it's about women absolutely trapped by society in their own circumstances so no that doesn't translate to modern times but there are certainly some underlying themes that, that I think everyone would feel um, um, are still relevant today and in fact it's actually been interesting to see recently that I think Apple TV is about to do a serialized version of the custom of the country and that's one of her more kind of modern novels where she predicts a lot of American society today like she she talks a lot about celebrity and you know the Met Gala and um, um, boom and bust on Wall Street and you know millionaire tycoons and and, and even kind of predicts Twitter to some extent, and, and there's a there is a um, a character in the custom of the country that that you would just say is Donald Trump. There's no doubt about it. You, you, you know, so she's amazing at how she predicts the future as well. So I, I think you, although you know not entirely, I think a lot of the things she writes about do have resonance for us today. Philippa, will you give us a reading from the book, please? Sure. Um, this is actually from the novella. So this is the modern part of the book. Um, so she she must find out, you know, as I said before, some of the what secrets of her life survived. So she reads the novella out to the others that are in the room with her. Um, and this is one of the scenes from the novella. <clears throat> um, it takes place in Italy. There are two characters who don't really know each other. They're just a little bit acquainted. One is an, an older American man, his name's Austin, and he's recently retired from the oil industry. And the other is a young woman called Medora who is from New Zealand. <coughs> and they're in a garden. Um, dropping to the edge of the fountain, Medora said, you remind me of my father. Austin was caught by her expression, open and curious. Joining her on the edge, she said, I thought he was a loser. Did I say that? She seemed puzzled. No, my father's a fund manager. Austin started to laugh, but he wasn't sure why. His daughter Stephanie is a week younger than me. Austin felt his laugh to dry up. He didn't understand. He's a regular family guy, right down to the Labrador. A short pause, and she said, do you have a dog? No. <clears throat> Sometimes my mother called me Persephone, goddess of the underworld, queen of the shadows. The stone edge felt cold beneath his palms. He paid her to keep quiet. And did she? Sure, until I was 10. That's when we turned up at Stephanie's birthday party. I was in my party dress. I didn't understand that we hadn't been invited. Austin held still. They had pink and white balloons. Even a magician, I'd never seen a house that big. Even the front door was huge and trees. It was almost a park. He shifted uneasily. It was like listening to a private conversation. He didn't want her to continue, but he didn't want her to stop. Stephanie had just started a new school. Her mother was pleased to be meeting her new friend. She gave us a lovely welcome and pretended not to notice my present was wrapped in old paper. We went through to the back garden where there was a swimming pool and a table of party food and so many kids. I got confused when I saw my father. I wasn't expecting him. He was carrying a massive cake and I thought it was for me. Got so excited I hadn't seen him for months and he had birthday cake. Funny thing is I can't remember what the cake was like, she shrugged. I can picture everything else, calling out to him, the pool water as I ran past, his expression, I try not to remember that, but the cake? Sometimes I think it was a princess cake, but that's just a guess. Whenever I look at it directly, the cake sort of explodes. She kept her focus on the fountain spray. So tell me about being an environmental engineer. He was relaxed, pleased to take the conversation where she wanted to go. He said, water quality, looking after discharge. I started as a process engineer, but my job title got changed. I was never going to save rainforests, Madura. Did you make the world a better place? 
From side on, she was perfect, a small up-turned nose and gently curved neck. He looked away. I stopped at getting a fraction worse, she nodded. A picture suddenly came to mind, something he hadn't thought about in years. He said, there was a guy who came to my son's child care centre, environmental educator, pulled up in a massive sport utility painted with birds and trees, told the kids to care for the planet. It would be theirs one day unless they kept using fossil fuels. Then he roared off to another school. Austin shrugged. I always biked to work. Is there a moral to the story? Not really. Adora's face was angled up towards the sun. Her lashes were dark against pale olive skin pulled tight across her cheekbones. He said, you still think I'm guilty of selling out? No, I don't think guilt is absolute. What do you mean? It's more like a sliding scale of culpability. Medora dipped her fingers into the water, then drew across on the chalky stone edge. She looked up. There are so many types of guilt by neglect or association. A slow appreciation of sin, a slow accretion of sins that finally tips the balance. Austin was intrigued that she'd given it so much thought. Guilt is just a judgment call, and who's to judge? An old man in a wig who drinks too much and bangs a stenographer after work on Fridays? Or the moral majority using outrage to cover their own dirty secrets? During another chalky cross, she added, the only thing that counts is your conscience. Only you know the extent of your guilt. Austin wondered what had prompted Medora to so carefully consider this. He was about to ask when she said, I once lobbied against a cell phone tower near our school. Did you win? No, but I got a year of free texts. Thanks very much. Kia ora, Philippa. Thank you for that reading. Um, it's interesting in that passage you read, the notion of dirty secrets coming up because that's obviously a lot of what your book is exploring mm -hmm. and I wondered about Wharton who was such a grand dame in many ways and created these beautiful homes for herself in Massachusetts and in France had her big staff um, you know was really obsessed with garden design and interior design and I wonder do you think she was trying to control her environment in a way when so much in her own private life was very chaotic and unhappy mm -hmm. um the thing that's fascinating about her is she's a woman of contradictions. Um, so I think even when you're thinking about <clears throat> her houses and her gardens, sometimes she'd have house guests coming to stay and they'd blah, blah, blah. So her day was literally divided into two halves. So she would spend the morning, sometimes in bed, just scribbling madly, just, just writing. All the stuff would pour out of her. She wrote 40, she didn't she wasn't published when she was 40 and she wrote 40 books so you know she was incredibly prolific and she would just spend all morning in this mad kind of just productive panic just creating paper everywhere and and then suddenly midday <clears throat> she'd get dressed up in her finery go out into her beautiful house her beautiful gardens with all her beautiful friends and spend the rest of the day being this you know this perfect woman in this perfect house and perfect garden and stuff but the whole morning had just been spent writing about you, you know we tend to think she just writes about manners and, and things but you know some of it's really gritty and, and and really um exploring the dark side of life so um that's how i like to see her as a woman of complete contradictions because you know back then for a woman of her class to be writing fiction fiction was considered you know something that nice people didn't indulge in so um she was she she dealt between the two worlds incredibly well and in a very sort of organized legal kind of way she was involved in war work during world war one in france did she not travel to the front to do reporting of yeah. some kind yeah. um the war was um brought out some of the best and worst in her she was she became a huge organizer and she she um, won a number of medals later in recognition of her work. So what she achieved during the war is incredible in terms of starting up work rooms for women to, um, for sewing and um, housing refugees from, from Belgium and setting up tuberculosis hospitals, all that stuff. But what she really loved, of course, was writing. So she went to the front line, I think it was six trips. Um, again, a very Edith style, you know, big car with a chauffeur, of course, um, and her friend Walter Berry. But, you know, what she saw at the front line and what she recorded is incredibly valuable for us today. And we, and we never think of her as a war correspondent, but, but that's what she was. She was incredibly brave. <clears throat> Very, this is really fascinating, and I would happily talk to you for longer, but we have to move on in a moment. Um, I, please join us again at the, at the end of the session so we can talk some more. And I encourage uh, listeners and viewers, 
if you have any specific questions for Philippa, please send them in because this is really very interesting and a very enjoyable and novel way of uh, approaching her story and the secret she left behind. Kia ora, Philippa. Thank you. Thanks. Our next guest today is writer and performer Freya Daly Sadgrove. Freya's debut poetry collection is called Head Girl, and she really was a head girl, so let no one dispute her credentials. She said that the impulse to stand on stage and give rousing speeches to girls in blazers is probably the exact same urge as the urge to write poetry. The book's dedication, which is For My Enemies, signals the spirit, subversion, and wit of Freya's work. Like Hera Lindsay Bird, who describes Freya as, unfortunately, the absolute best, she dissects and interrogates the experience of being a young woman unafraid to be profane. Uh, she is a graduate of Victoria University of Wellington. And I just wanted to mention briefly that during the course of our discussion and Freya's reading, there may be some material that is not suitable for children. So please uh, use discretion. Um, kia ora, Freya. Kia ora. Maybe um, not suitable for children could be the title of your next collection. Yeah, <laughs> it's, um, I have a, a couple of girls who I um, who I babysit sometimes and who I've known for about ten years, um, and they're very excited for me to publish a book, but um, they're not allowed to read it until they're <laughs> I don't know thirty. Thirty, I think that's probably a good age. Now, um, it's really interesting talking to you after discussing Edith Wharton with with Philippa because your work in a way is a dance as well between revelation and positioning. And I know you've questioned the term confessional because as you said, maybe every choice to reveal something very personal about myself in a poem just obscures something else. And I wondered if you could talk about how creating a collection like yours is some kind of a dance between your private and public worlds. Hmm. Um, yeah, I... It's very strange for me to read it now because it's very revealing of um, a, a specific time in my life um, that is I'm quite separate from now in many ways. Um, but oh yeah, it's it, it's funny to me now to read it because it does it does say some things some very quite intense things about my life that I don't know if I have the same um if I would have the same approach now um but it felt like what I had to do um it, it felt like what I had to write about um and uh, yeah I mean I they, I don't like I like telling the truth and I also don't like lying and I think they're kind of mm, they're different things. Does that make sense? I don't know. I absolutely. Yeah. I, I didn't say I, everything. Sorry, go go ahead. I, I just I I didn't say I didn't say everything in the book, but I did say like there was like, I guess, <laughs> a lot to say. Um and uh yeah, I did I didn't I didn't say everything that was happening during that time, but um it's uh there's a lot of like things it's some a lot of uh, really what to how do I say it <laughs> it's um yeah let's I don't know how to keep going with that to be honest that's, right. that's okay I'm, I'm interested in you as someone who's also a, a performer and involved in the world of theatre as well as writing poetry and I wondered about you performing your poetry live and in public how is that important to your co-papa as a writer and how does it affect your voice on the page? Are you conscious when you're writing of it being something you will perform? It's not something that people will only engage with on the page. Yeah, um, I guess it's been a really big thing with this book because I've, I did the MA um, in 2014 and I only really started sort of doing poetry readings around then. So I'd never really... I was, you always are concerned with like rhythm and and sound when you're writing poetry so always when I'm writing I have to read things aloud to myself um anyway but definitely with this collection um I had started to get somewhere in terms of um kind of like comic timing 
um, or not just comic timing, but like an an idea of um, of of delivery, um, which is a big thing, obviously in theatre, um, how you how you deliver a script or whatever. Um, and so writing this part of my the actual form on the page is definitely informed by my own. <clears throat> yeah kind of style of delivery and a lot of it is like there's lots of gags and so part of how they come across on the line is definitely I'm definitely thinking about how to make that land in a in a um in a fun way especially so it has to be I really like it for it to be fun for me to read um and so that's yeah definitely a big thing when I'm when I'm writing I'm just thinking about the difference between theatre and performing your poetry, because theatre in a way is about assuming identities or, or personas, whereas mm. reading your poetry is perhaps perceived by any given audience to be the truth, as you've been saying. But I wonder if Head Girl itself is, is a persona that you adopt when you're reading from this collection. Yeah, hardcore. It's it's funny because I... Um, I... Um, Oh, I um. Oh, what am I saying? Um, definitely. My 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 little my little brain's just just gone very Sunday morning. Um. Um. Sorry. Can we? Can you just the we were in theatre. Can you help me again? Yeah, sure. Because we. I mean, your book's called Head Girl, and as I said, you were a head girl, but it's also like a persona or a character. Yeah. Yeah. You're inhabiting in a way, isn't it? Yeah, so um, de- yeah, so when I do a reading and when I watch poetry readings, I always um, want to um, I want to like stop myself going into a, like a poem voice or whatever, you know, because it's you can It's very hard to avoid. Everyone has a has a special poem voice, and I always get a little bit turned off by it. And I know that I do it, and it's very hard to avoid. But definitely with Head Girl, it, it it's almost like I'm trying to, even in the poems, trying to fight against um, becoming like too poemy. But then also, Head Girl is definitely a persona of like being that kind of bolshy, um, rude, um, rejecting um, particular kind of poetic um, moods, I guess. Does that make sense? It's definitely. It's also funny when you say about theatre because I was thinking it made me think of um, about theatre being roles that you that you t- go into. Um, I remember uh, when I was doing theatre training. Um, I don't know about ten years ago. I was very much um, of had this idea that oh, like playing a character is this is such a relief because you get to not be yourself for a while. And when I was young, I was, I didn't really like being myself. And so I thought that theater was like an escape, but um, my director at the time, Bill Mbassana, um said to me this thing that really changed my attitude, which was, you're not escaping yourself in theater, you're finding a new part of yourself. Um, that is, there's, there's truth in it. So then, yeah, I don't know. That definitely made me be like, oh, anything that I perform is already in me. Does that make sense? Like any character, <laughs> it sounds kind of horrible, like method actory or something, but um, but there's just, there's so much in a person that you can access in yourself to bring to the stage to be a persona. Um, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I suppose, I mean, coming at it from a novelist point of view, it's it's what you are doing essentially in creating characters. You you're inhabiting each of them in turn. That yeah. they're not something that's external to you really. Yeah, you, they come out at some level of your experience and your imagination. Now I, I feel that we should move to the reading, but before you read a poem, um, I'll give my little warning again. But you've been very open about having depression, seeing a therapist. I believe your therapist attended your book launch. Yeah. Um, and so you've written quite openly about that. Do you want to say anything about the poem you're going to read before you read it to us? Yeah, so um, it, it's a poem that deals with um, depression because a lot of a lot of the poems in the book do, um, and and sort of 
this particular poem is called Ah, Real Depression. Um, it's about growing up, having, <laughs> growing up and dealing with depression. So there's a little bit of mention of um, suicide, but it's not intense um, in this particular poem, but it's, it's you know, heavy for some people. Um, and there's also, I think, one swear word, possibly more. Those are my warnings. Shall I, shall I get into it? Please do. Okay. Okay. It's called Our Real Depression, which is a kind of gratuitous reference to a 90s Nickelodeon show called Our Real Monsters. <clears throat> okay. You know that feeling when you've just given birth to an abomination and then the midwife hands it to you, like you're supposed to love it and fucking clean it for the rest of time? A gross baby has slunk out of me. I've had such a shock. It is my depression. God, it is so fugly. I can't even look at it. I get postnatal depression from birthing my first depression. Now I got two depressions on my hands and counting. Old people shake their heads and glare at me in the street. I don't even know how to masturbate yet. Look, in this backward country, I was not allowed to abort my depression, okay? They were like, it'll be both character building and um, very hip in 10 years. Just don't tell anyone we said it. But oh, what a resilient girl I am. How clever and resourceful. How unfazed by my little predicament. I am in my bedroom wrapping up my depressions in cellophane. I am carrying them around in all girls high school like a cheap bouquet. So all the girls think it is my birthday. Ha. Every single day they notice me, which I love. I love to be noticed. I love to be noticed by high schoolers. And they do not pause to question how I can have been born every single day of the year. No, I was naturally born, born to make my way in the world. I came out of the womb with a bindle over my shoulder. I reckon I am impressive at a young age. My CV on LinkedIn runs to 40 pages. The list of awards and scholarships is very, very long. I reckon the panel of recruiters will marvel at my wealth of experience, but one or two of them have their doubts. Kevin's like, um, if you've had this many depressions, how can you still be, you know, alive? Someone points to my nicely formatted but functionally insubstantial history of suicide and goes, have you ever even, like, passed out? It is at this point that I realize I am not young but fucking old. The three recruiters are so fresh and sexy. Hang on, I think to myself. There is a certain fugliness behind all that sex appeal that I think I recognize. And then I have it. I'm being interviewed by three of my own grown up depressions. They have aged well, but not too much, like a mid range cheddar. I experience a disconcerting mixture of pride and humiliation, like a good but not award winning actor in a movie. We hug and they nepotize me right away. I shoot up the ranks in a few short years. Kevin raises his eyebrows and calls me unscrupulous. God, I hate Kevin. I sit in my big office hating Kevin, but not the others. And I think to myself, I am not satisfied. Well, if I know anything about capitalism, I mean depression. It's that I personally can have what I want if I want it enough. And what I want is a large parade a large parade to parade my depression around the city. That'll show Kevin. Boy, oh boy, do people love to make it easy for me. I only have to whimper and they're like, call the friggin' mayor. And it's happening. It's really happening for me. I mean, it's not just for me. It is for everyone to enjoy. I boom through the loudspeakers, spreading my arms like a depressed eagle. I don't feel very IRL, but I do feel something. Afterwards, I go around each person on my float and personally request a pat on the back. I am a diva. I am at a primary school assembly telling the children about my depression. I am saying, you will probably be depressed when you are older. 
if you are not already depressed. Parents complain and I do not get paid for talking about my depression. <laughs> Thank you very much, Freya. Thanks so much for that. Thank you. It's, re it's really interesting that we talked about your desire not to have a poetry voice and then to hear you read because Do my poetry voice <laughs> <laughs> but I mean that that's the spoken word the, the rhythms of the spoken word that's very untheatrical that naturalism that you're trying to achieve is very evident when you read to us thanks <laughs> I mean you also in many of your poems really get to the heart of notions of discomfort and shame it might be the shame of a breakup or the shame of the way um, the persona in your poems behaves in certain situations. Mm. Is Does that make it uncomfortable to write as well as read? Are you forcing yourself into dark places when you write? Um, I didn't force myself when I was writing this book because I was really in the dark places. I'm like not right now, which is really nice. So it's kind of weird to read them, but like, um uh I there's so much self-hatred in the book um which was just um so part of me writing it it was really there was this weird conflict that I had where I because I I had like that shame was just like just occupying my entire life and being um and I wanted to express it and I and I wanted to be believed like I wanted people to believe that I was the bad person that I believed myself to be. And I wanted to like get people on side in that way. But I also obviously wanted to be forgiven, I think. Um, so it, to be allowed to be that kind of, this kind of horrible person that part of, that a lot of the book is kind of uh, putting, putting forward, I guess, the persona. Are there any particular writers you feel are, are major influences on the way you write? Yeah, I mean, definitely hear it. Like, you, I can't kind of, she, she comes up first whenever, whenever I think about that question, um, because she, um, for one thing, she was a big part of how I came to write again after doing the MA where I had a big break where I didn't write. Um, and when I read her writing, which was after that, I didn't come to it very early. Um, I was I was freed, I think, by it. That sounds corny, but like she made, like her writing makes me feel like I can like have fun with my writing, like, and I can do what I want and it can be silly and, um, naughty in ways that like I guess I mean I was I was kind of getting there but it just awakened a kind of naughtiness in in my writing that I'm very grateful to have kind of had opened up um and then like the people who the the people who got me um excited about poetry kind of in my adult life as opposed to when I was a kid um I like Sylvia Plath and Caroline Duffy, who I was introduced to in high school and who kind of made me go, oh, it's playtime with words again. And like, also how, you know, they're, especially Sylvia obviously is like putting everything on the page. Um, so those are like, those are my main influences. And then like all my friends, because we all read each other's poems and like feed off each other, I guess, which is a really a nice thing about the kind of poetry community in, in Aotearoa, but also in Australia, are some of my kind of the community that we influence each other, I suppose. That's really great. Fred, I'm really sorry that we're out of time because this is extremely interesting, but please hang around and we will talk some more towards the end of the hour. Kia ora, thank you very much. Our third writer today is Helon Habila, a Nigerian writer who now lives in the US. A novelist, poet and journalist, Helon has won numerous awards, including the prestigious Kane Prize uh, for a short story, that's Africa's premier short story award, the Commonwealth Writers' Prize for Best First Novel from Africa, and the Wyndham Campbell Literature Prize from, from Yale. 
He's also the editor of the Granter book of the African short story and currently teaches creative writing at George Mason University in Virginia. Helen's fourth novel is Travelers, which is set in contemporary Europe and centered on the diasporic African experience. The Guardian Review described the book as having it all, intelligence, tragedy, poetry, love, intimacy, compassion, and a serious, soulful, arms wide engagement with one of the most acute human concerns of our age, the refugee crisis. Kia ora and welcome, Helen. Hello, thank you for having me. Thank you very much for joining us. Now, the narrator of your novel, uh, at the beginning of your novel, is in Berlin because his wife, an American artist, has a residency there. And the New York Times described him as a privileged Nigerian academic, he's a grad student, who has more in common with the refugees he encounters than he first realizes. And I wonder how much you saw his story as a sort of odyssey, which is both physical and emotional. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a kind of process of growth for him, for the unnamed main character. Um, and in a way, I, I kind of liken his experience to my own experience because I was in Berlin for one year doing a fellowship. Um, I went there to write a novel, different novel. But then this was in 2013. And the year I got there in the summer, um, there was an accident, a boat capsized in the Mediterranean. Migrants were coming from Africa to, you know, to Italy and their boat capsized. About 300 people died. And I was invited by a newspaper in Berlin. You know, they wanted an African writer to tell them, you know, what he thinks about the tragedy. Um, so for me, it was that encounter that kind of introduced me, even though I knew that things like that were happening. But I was a fellow in Berlin and we live in this kind of bubble. You know, you could live your whole life there and not really engage with these things happening out there. So for me, when I started interviewing people to write my essay for the newspaper, that was really when I kind of stepped out of that bubble. So it was my odyssey in a way, just like this character began to encounter, you know, these migrants because his wife is an artist and she invites them to her house to paint their pictures. That was her project that she was working on. And he began to get interested in them. And gradually he began to kind of move away from that bubble and eventually he really is submerged, if you like, into their lives. And he realized that he has a lot in common with them than he has, you know, um, difference with them. We learn in the novel um, of a place where many of the refugees live and it's the place is called Heim, which sounds like home, but it has quite a different meaning for the refugees. And it made me think of that German concept of Heimat, you know, or homeland. And I wondered what you thought about can outsiders ever really be at home in Europe? Can the African diaspora ever find a place in Germany, even in a very multicultural city like Berlin? That's a very hard question to answer. You know, can they ever find a home? Um, can we ever find a home in this world? Um, you know, what is home? That's, I guess, the question I was trying to, to, to answer in the book. Are we ever at home anywhere? Um, the thing is that the, 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 the place that they thought was their home, they lost it, you know, um, their native homes, the place that they thought they belonged in, they lost it. So that kind of burst the idea of having a home in the first place. And we've seen this experience happening on the world. People would live in their countries, in their villages, in their home, homelands. And then something crazy would happen, something they never expected was going to happen. It would happen and then they have to move. So there's always that kind of um, provisionality in the idea of home. It's always a provi provisional place, you know, until we ultimately find, you know, whatever we think home is, home could be anywhere. And I guess the point is about the impermanence of home. And all of us have to answer the question, you know, what is home to us? Um, I'm in America here, I'm an African in America, I guess, trying to find a home here. I left my home. And um, do I feel at home here? I don't know. Would this 
Africans, even if they are granted documents and they, they live there, would they ever feel at home? I don't know if it's always, um, if, if it's ever going to be home to them. So I don't think there's a kind of permanent home. You're just in a place that you're trying to kind of make a life for yourself and for your family and to in a way achieve your dreams up to the level that you can achieve in that place um, until you eventually move to that, you know, eternal home <laughs> that we all have to go to. Just uh, thinking, listening to you speak about outsiders, because there's a really powerful scene um, quite early in the novel when the narrator attends uh, a May Day uh, protest and gets caught up in it and pushed to the ground and sees there on the ground something that we see all over Berlin and uh, are really reminders of impermanence. And there are those the little the little plaques you see in the ground. Would you just talk about those for our viewers, those names that he reads, what they're about? Yeah, exactly. And that, that's, um, that's a good point. Um, and that links to the last question that you asked about the illusion of having a home. Um, so the little plaques that he see, the bronze plaques that you sometimes see in front of buildings in Berlin, uh, kind of memorializing the Jews that lived in those buildings and that were taken from their homes and transported to all the um, concentration camps. So this things were put there by some charity organizations, um, anti-Semitic organizations, and they're all over Berlin. And um, so my character falls down and he sees this, this place and he begins to think about history and other things and how, you know, impermanent all these things are. So the idea of home for these Jews who lived in Germany and Europe for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years could be transported just in one day and taken to these places and told that they don't belong there and they're outsiders. And you know that underlines the whole thing we're talking about, about the illusion of, of home and belonging. Now your narrator befriends someone called Mark who is a um, Malawian film student. And we first meet Mark living in very precarious state financially and legally. And he's squatting in a church and in a neighborhood called Kreuzberg. And that immediately had resonance for me um, of a, for another novel of outsiders, um, Christopher Isherwood's Goodbye to Berlin, because part of that is set in Kreuzberg as well. It's such a city that draws artists and the unconventional. And uh, I wondered with your year there, when you were on your DAAD fellowship, uh, did you feel it was a place where you could grow as a writer or I mean, did it, you talk about it changed your novel project, you changed from writing one book to another. Is it somewhere that was very important to you creatively and personally? Oh yeah, Berlin is a beautiful place for, for writers and for artists. It's, it has everything, you know, it has the museums, it has libraries, the cinemas and everything there. And the DAID especially kind of um, encouraged artists to interact with each other. So it wasn't just for writers, it was for movie makers, it was for painters, it was for musicians. So you always, you know, interacted and you kind of learned from each other. Um, so it was a wonderful, wonderful um, one year. And I encourage, you know, any artist to apply um, for, for, for the fellowship. I, I, I never really wanted to go to, to, to Berlin to Germany because I had this idea always. Um, I had never been there before. And my idea of Germany, you know, kind of dated back to the Second World War. All the books I was reading, it's about, you know, um, Nazis and the, the war and, you know, how Germans are always kind of portrayed as the enemy. So I grew up reading that kind of literature because I grew up in Nigeria, which was colonized by the British. So basically all the literature that we read from the Second World War Kind of, kind of authorized the German. So I was always scared of Germany. I never wanted to go. And then I went there with my family and my children. You know, with my mouth in my, with my heart in my mouth. And it was like the best one year. You know, I had ever spent in my life. You know, the people were so friendly. The food was good. Um, my kids didn't want to come back. <laughs> so and I learned so much. And of course, I, I, I kind of wrote my book. But there's always that shadow in the background of all the migrants, you know, coming from Africa, you always met them on the streets. And um, 
so it was a mixture of so many things, a kind of learning experience, like you said, an odyssey. Um, but I, I had a great time. So, yeah. How long will you read to us from the novel, please? Of course. So I'm going to read from the first page of Travelers. And basically, this section introduces the, the main character and it introduces Berlin um, to the reader. We came to Berlin in the fall of 2012, and at first, everything was fine. We lived on Vorkelstrasse, next to a park. Across the road was an apotheker, and next to that, a retirement home, and next to that, a residential school for orphans. The school was once a home for single mothers, but eventually, the mothers moved on, and only the children were left. The school is made up of two chairless structures, one noticeably newer than the other, behind waist-high cinder block walls and giant fir trees. In the evenings, the children run in the park, jumping on trampolines and kicking around balls, their voices cutting through the frigid air, clear as a bell ringing. In the mornings, they sat in the courtyard behind the short fence to craft wooden animals and osier baskets under the watchful eyes of their minders. Once, out early with Gina, one of the boys, anywhere between the ages of eight and 10, sighted us and rushed to the low wall. He leaned over the top, almost vaulting over, his face lit up with smiles, all the while waving to us and shouting, chocolada, chocolada. I turned away, ignoring him. Gina stopped and waved back to him. Hello, how his eyes grew and grew in his tiny face. Surprise mingled with pleasure as he ran back to his mates. He repeated this whenever he saw us, and Gina always indulged him. But I never got used to him. I never got used to the thin, eager voice and how the other children, about a dozen or so, stopped and raised their eerily identical blonde heads and blue eyes to watch him waving and calling chocolada as if his life depended on it. I first met Mark when he came to the house with one of Gina's flyers in his hands. I'm here for this, he said, waving the yellow flyer. He said Gina was working on a series of portraits she called Travelers, and she was looking for real migrants to sit for her. 50 euros a session to be paid for by the fellowship. I pointed him to the guest room she had converted into a studio. Soon, their voices carried to the living room Hers, polite but firm. His, qu questioning, arguing. He was being turned down, and I could have told him not to press. Gina would never change her mind. Later, when I asked her why, she said he wasn't right and didn't elaborate. But I guessed he looked too young. His face was too smooth, and lacking the character only time and experience brings. Last week, she had drawn a lady and her four-year-old daughter. I met the lady in the living room, waiting for Gina to set up her easel, still wearing her outdoor coat, an old woolen affair. And when I asked her if she wanted me to take the coat, she shook her head. I turned to the daughter. Did she want a drink? She pulled the child closer to her. The week before that, it was a man, Manu, who told me he was a doctor in his former life. Now he worked as a bouncer in a nightclub waiting for the result of his asylum application. His face was lined, prematurely old, and I knew Gina would love these lines. One of them, an eloquent, each one of them an eloquent testimony to what he had left behind to the borders and rivers and deserts he had in Berlin. She would also love the woman's hands that tightly clutched her daughter's arm. They were dry and scaly, the nails chipped no doubt ruined while working in some hotel laundry room or as a scholarly maid. I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Helen. You mentioned Manu in that reading and he's a Libyan of Nigerian extraction who is very central to the story. There's uh, another very important character, Portia, who is um, the daughter of a Zambian writer. And I mean, everyone's in Europe looking for something or I mean, it's where their aspirations come to die. When you met with Manu there that, you know, in his former life, there's very much a sense of, with your characters 
of their former lives versus their present lives. Um, could we also just briefly, I feel like I'm trying to pack so much into our, our little section here because I'm conscious of time passing, but towards the end of your novel, uh, Helen's reporting on going home to Nigeria. Sorry, Helen, your narrator is reporting on going home to Nigeria and disappointing his mother because he no longer has his American wife. And um, your narrator says, I could hear the shame in her voice. Her son who had gone to America had returned poorer and thinner than he had left. I mean, did, in the novel, is, uh, is the refugee experience ever one that can really work out happily or successfully for your characters? Um. It's for some of them, I guess, you know, um, things work out to some extent that they still have their life, you know, and they, 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 can, they can look towards tomorrow and, and kind of achieve some kind of um, minimum, you know, of their aspirations. Um, but it's always hard to kind of get the full fruition of your dream as, as a migrant because you have left so much behind and um, you always be looking back at what you have left behind and kind of wondering what you could have been, what might have been if you had stayed back um, in your country. And to, to that extent, you know, you are never really going to be that 100% um, fulfilled. Um, but like I said earlier, you know, most of them just, just want to um, kind of create a better future for their children. and is true with most migrants. They don't see um, their life as being the main thing. The main thing is for the next generation, for their children. Um, they, 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 they sacrifice so much. You know, some of them like doctors who, who were doctors in their former life now become bouncers or they become, you know, um, um, you know waiters in restaurants or dishwashers just so they can send their children to school. So basically they have sacrificed all their life so that the next generation and the next generation could become more than they, they, they were able to become. Um, that, that's, that's, I think the idea of, of migrating is sacrifice. Mm. Yeah. I would, I'd like to talk now, maybe bring the other two writers back because I wanted to, uh, to, us to discuss uh, the Black Lives Matter movement that is obviously an international one and important to us in New Zealand as well as in the US and the UK and Europe, etc. Now, in, in Helen's novel, um, Philippa and, and Freya, the narrator's wife, Gina, as we discussed, is an artist. And there's a quote from the book that says she, she seems more oblivious of what was happening around her as they stay in Europe. And I wondered if you could all think about and maybe talk about in our current moment of mass international protests and awareness of Black Lives Matter, can an artist be oblivious? Can we as writers separate ourselves from the social and political moment? And Helen, would you like to, to address this as a, a Nigerian writer living right now in Virginia, just to step away from the US Capitol? Yeah, I mean, so much is happening. It's so um, exciting to be in America at this time. I've been in this country about 13 years now. I came in 2007 and I've never witnessed, you know, this kind of, um, you know, uprising, I don't want to use the word uprising, but kind of public protests and demonstrations and people of all color from all walks of life um, coming together to protest, to say that enough is enough. And um, to kind of go more directly to your question, there's no excuse you know, for an artist, for anyone really, to not, not to be engaged in this, to keep quiet is actually being, you know, against the movement. You have to be for it because this is such a defining moment. And I'm happy to see that a lot of the protesters are actually white people. And it's a chance for white people to actually educate themselves about what's happening because we are never going to achieve that, you know, Black Lives Matter, objective until white people begin to speak out and to reject racism and to you know take a stand alongside their black brothers and sisters that's the only way this is going to go away we've had quite a substantial protests here in new zealand obviously it's an issue um close to our hearts here but freya and philippa what's your view on the the importance of a writer 
being seen and heard and not being, as Helen's suggesting, complicit in, in the alternative. Do you have feelings about this, Freya? Um, I, I completely agree that you can, there's no, you can't be silent. Um, as Helen said, it's silence is, is complicity. It's definitely, um, it's a complex one as a Pākehā writer to be like, what, what can I add to a conversation? It's more about, I don't know, my, I'm finding at the moment that like, um, I'm not writing poetry at the moment, but I am working on another project and, it, and kind of the, um, uh, I don't want to say moment because it's not a moment. It doesn't feel like something that is gonna die down. You know, it, this is this is the new, this is where we are, this is the direction we're heading in. And in all of the projects that I'm working on at the moment, it is present. Um, and there's no, yeah, it, it, it's unignorable. It's it's weird with poetry, I guess, because the kind of poetry that I write is so, and has been so kind of self-centered. Um, and I guess in a way I'm like a little bit um, ready to put that kind of writing a little bit behind me. I don't know, it'll always be selfish in some ways, I guess, but like I'm much more kind of, interested in looking out um, now. But yeah, it's also, it's, it's, yeah, also have to figure out when to shut up, obviously. And that's hard <laughs> sometimes as a writer, um, but it's a time for listening. That's, that's where I'm at. Philippa, what do you think? Oh, I think it's lovely when you said it's a time for listening. I think, um, as a writer, you have to reflect what's going on in the world and what is around you. You can't ignore that. But for me, it's also slightly tied up with the whole pandemic. And we have these two opposing things going on. One where we're more connected to the world than we've ever been in terms of the internet and just constant media streaming. But at the other hand, we've got locked borders. We're completely isolated at the bottom of the world. And um, I like when Pratt Pratt said it's time for listening because I personally have found I have not written in the last couple of months. I've, I've just been so overwhelmed. I can't, I can't write. I'm just trying to process. Um, so I guess it, it is, is um, it may not be that I'm writing right now, but I'm thinking and I'm listening and it will be interesting to see what comes out in the years to come, I think. But just at the moment for me, there is so much going on. I'm just, processing. <laughs> yeah. Helen, do you see this as a turning point? I think so. I mean, it's it's never happened, you know, on a, on this scale before. I mean, it's literally all over the world, even in some countries that you never expected, you know, would be interested in such things. Um, but I kind of, I, I, I see it as kind of symbolic moment. And even in Africa, we should learn from this. I mean, there's it's not it's not about black and white there, but about you know power and powerlessness there. So this is a moment for people who have no power really to speak out and to be noticed. And I think African leaders and African politicians should also kind of sit up and look at what's happening. You cannot continue to ignore poor people and and think that everything's going to be okay, you know, whether it's in terms of color minority or kind of a power minority, you have to make everything inclusive. Now you have to really be better, you know, leaders all over the world. Yeah. I've, we've run over time a little bit today. This has been an extremely interesting discussion. Um, thank you so much to Philippa Swan, Freya Daly Sagrove and Helen Habila and to everyone else who has made this episode possible. Thank you so much, writers. It was really interesting thank talking you. to you. I should also thank the Auckland Writers Festival team, of course, Auckland Live and Copyright Licensing New Zealand as well. Kia ora to the sponsors and, and partners listed on the festival website. Thank you so much for your generous support. Now, remember, you can order these books, and I, I urge you to do so right away. You can view this episode again on the festival website. If you'd like a copy of the 2020 Festival Programme, which is your reading guide for the rest of the year, please contact the festival and they will send one out to you right away. Um, join us again next week when our guests are 
Harvard Law Professor Cass Sunstein, the author of many influential books, including Nudge, uh, discussing his latest work, How Change Happens. Uh, Selena Tusitala Marsh, uh, former poet laureate and my own dear colleague at the University of Auckland on her graphic memoir, Moped and Pulitzer Prize winning author Samantha Power, the US ambassador to the UN under Obama's administration, discussing her best-selling memoir, The Education of an Idealist. See you same time, same place next week. Haere rā. <laughs>